The working day is thus not a constant, but a variable quantity. One of its parts, certainly, is determined by the working time required for the reproduction of the labour power of the labourer himself, but its total amount varies with the duration of the surplus labour. The working day is therefore determinable, but is, per se, indeterminate. From the previous chapters, we now understand that the working day is essentially split into two sections that period of the day when the labourer is reproducing their own labour power or necessary labour, and that period of the day when the labourer is producing surplus value for the capitalist or surplus labour. For now, in our examples, we will assume that the amount of necessary labour that the workers need to reproduce themselves is at a constant and fixed at six hours. We will represent this period as a line from A to B. So A to B is six hours of necessary labor. That period of the day that labor is performing surplus labor, creating the surplus value for the capitalist, will represent on the line from B to C. So B to C is surplus labor. This means that while our necessary labor is fixed, the length of the working day is not. It can fluctuate. For example, a working day of 12 hours and 100% exploitation rate can be represented as a to B, six hours, B to C, six hours. A working day of nine hours and the exploitation rate of 50% can be represented as A to B, six hours, B to C, three hours. And a working day of seven hours with the exploitation rate of 16% can be represented as A to B, six hours, B to C, one hour and so on for however many different variations on the extra amount of surplus labour hours that are performed in a day. While we can see that the length of surplus labour in a working day is flexible, Marx highlights that it does have limits. Firstly, under capitalism, it cannot be zero hours. If it were, there would be no surplus value created, no profit for the capitalist, and as such wouldn't function as capitalist production. Secondly, there are maximum limits. Those are physical limits. There's only 24 hours in a day. Humans need rest, food, to wash and clothe themselves, etc. If they didn't do this, they would obviously very quickly die and there would be no more labor. As well as these physical limits, there are also moral limits. Humans require time for relaxation, enjoyment, intellectual pursuits, and social desires. Marx here points out that these requirements are, however, a product of the material and historical environments. What we desire as relaxation or our intellectual and social needs are a product of the current world around us and can be shaped and moulded by it. As an aside, this is an interesting point to think about as we read further through the book. So we see the variations of the working day fluctuates within physical and social bounds but both these limiting conditions are of a very elastic nature. We see many real-world examples of anywhere from 8 to 18 hours a day. The capitalist has bought the labour power at its day rate. To him, its use value belongs during one working day. He has thus acquired the right to make the labourer work for him during one day. But what is the working day? Marx concludes that a working day due to these limits is in any case less than a natural day of 24 hours. But by how much is determined by two factors, those of the buyers and the sellers of the commodity of labour power, the capitalists and the workers. As capitalist, he is only capital personified. His soul is the soul of capital. But capital has one single life impulse, the tendency to create value and surplus value to make its constant factor, the means of production, absorb the greatest possible amounts of surplus labor. Capital is dead labor. That vampire-like only lives by sucking living labor and lives the more, the more labor it sucks. That time during which the laborer works is the time during which the capitalists consume the labor power he has purchased of him. The capitalist, in the eyes of the law and exchange, has purchased labour power for the whole day. Their desire is to obtain the maximum amount of surplus value as possible from their purchase. 
If the laborers consume this time for themselves, they are robbing the capitalists. For the laborer, however, they understand that as a seller of their labor power, it is only a fair exchange if they sell what they can reproduce. They need to be able to reproduce it so they can sell it daily. Long working hours, however, impact on this reproduction process. By lengthening the working day, the capitalist could use up the amount of labor power in one day that it takes the laborer to reproduce themselves in three. The capitalist pays for one day's labor power whilst using that of three days. That is against the laborer's contract in the law of exchanges. We see then that the capitalist maintains their rights as a purchaser when they try to lengthen the working day, and the laborer maintains their rights as a seller when they try to shorten it. There is here therefore an antinomy, right against right, both equally bearing the seal of the law of exchanges. Between equal rights, force decides. Hence it is that in the history of capitalist production, the determination of what is a working day presents itself as the result of a struggle, a struggle between collective capital, i.e. the class of capitalists, and collective labourer, i.e. the working class. Capital has not invented surplus labour. Wherever a part of society possesses the monopoly of the means of production, the labourer, free or not free, must add to the working time necessary for his own maintenance and extra working time in order to produce the means of subsistence for the owners of the means of production. Whether this proprietor be the Athenian well-to-do man, Etruscan theocrat, Roman citizen, Norman baron, American slave owner, Wallachian boyard, modern landlord or capitalist. It is, however, clear that in any given economic formation of society, where not the exchange value, but the use value of the product predominates, surplus labor will be limited by a given set of wants, which may be greater or less, and that here no boundless thirst for surplus labor arises from the nature of the production itself. Hence in antiquity, overwork becomes horrible only when the object is to obtain exchange value in its specific independent money form, in the production of gold and silver. Marx now returns to an historical analysis to highlight a few interesting points. Mainly, that it is not the existence of surplus labour that defines capitalism. Surplus labour was around in many pre-capitalist societies. The difference between them, however, is that in pre-capitalist modes of production, surplus labour was subordinated or dependent on use values. That is, while labour or overworked labourers in these societies performed at a surplus, it was for the creation of the use values of the products itself. These use values would be produced by the workers, specifically for the ruling classes and landowners to consume for themselves. The surplus labour here is limited, in a sense. It can only produce, more or less, to the maximum of society's needs. The difference under the capitalist mode of production, however, is the other way round. The production of use values becomes subordinated to surplus labour and its surplus value. The creation of use values become about their ability to be exchange values and the extraction of surplus values for surplus money and profits. Capitalism seeks an endless amount of surplus labour, using society's needs for use values as the driving force for the creation of surplus value. Very roughly speaking, these pre-capitalist societies use surplus labour or growth as a method to obtain products for society's needs, whereas capitalism uses society's needs as a method to obtain growth or surplus value. It becomes limitless in this sense, a boundless thirst for more. But as soon as people, whose production still moves within the lower forms of slave labour, are drawn into the whirlpool of an international market dominated by the capitalist mode of production, the sale of their products for export become their principal interest. The civilised horrors of overwork are grafted onto the barbaric horrors of slavery. Marx points out that this was even viewable in the use of slavery as a labour force that while slavery certainly existed in pre-capitalist societies, and it was certainly barbaric, 
their labour was limited to the production of use values for society, and the slaves were producing food and necessities that would be used to reproduce their own labour. The emergence of the United States and its capitalist modes of production transform this paternal relationship into the horrors that we know the African people faced, where their lives meant nothing as they were used up in America's thirst for profits in the exchange value of cotton, which, as an aside, was being used to build England's textile industries. The necessary labour which the Wallachian peasant does for his own maintenance is distinctly marked off from his surplus labour on behalf of the boyard. The one he does on his own field, the other on the seigneurial estate. Marx now examines the corvée or unpaid or unfree labour that existed in the Danubian principalities, now modern-day Romania. Corvée labour consisted of a well-defined division between necessary and surplus labour. Peasants would work their own plots of land, growing food for their own needs for a few days a week, and the rest of the week they would work in the fields of their lords, producing foods for the ruling classes. We can see a distinct border between these two periods of labour. However, under capitalism, these periods slide into one another. Suppose the working day consists of six hours of necessary labour and six hours of surplus labour, then the free labourer gives the capitalist every week six times six or 36 hours of surplus labour. It is the same as if they worked three days in the week for themselves and three days in the week for free for the capitalist. But this is not viewable on the surface. Surplus labour and necessary labour become indistinct from one another under capitalism. We can therefore express the same relationship by saying that the labourer in every minute works 30 seconds for themselves and 30 seconds for the capitalist. The Factory Act of 1850 now in force allows for the average working day of 10 hours, i.e. for the first five days, 12 hours from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m., including half an hour for breakfast and an hour for dinner, and thus leaving 10 and a half working hours and eight hours for Saturday, of which half an hour is subtracted for breakfast. 60 working hours are left, 10 and a half for each of the first five days, seven and a half for the last. After the working class political agitation throughout the first half of the 1800s, eventually the Factory Act was passed by British Parliament in 1850 that forced some sections of industry to limit the average working days to 10 hours. This was, however, the average over the course of a week. So during the week, workers would be in the factories for 12 hours a day, including their lunch breaks and a further eight hours on Saturdays. Children under 13 were limited to being in work for six hours a day. This became the distinction of full-time and part-time, and people became defined by their personified labour time. Parliament assigned factory inspectors to view all factories and write reports on labour relations, which were then published twice a year. Marx now examines some of these reports on millwork to highlight that even though the working day was limited, capitalists still found a way to extract surplus labour. These reports carefully detail that a mill would usually start and finish work around 15 minutes before the legal times of 6am and 6pm every day. Workers were forced to miss 5-10 to 10 minutes from their breaks and lunches every day. Machines needed to be kept clean in order to work properly, and the act of cleaning wasn't classed by the capitalist as labour so the workers had to clean these machines before their work could begin. These practices of snatching a few minutes of extra labour became known as nibbling and crippling by the workers, as their time was nibbled away from them. These government reports conclude that an extra time amounted to around 5 hours and 40 minutes a week, or an extra 27 days work over the course of 50 weeks. The labourers were essentially working 13 months a year. A final quote is left from a capitalist to a factory inspector. If you allow me to work only 10 minutes in the day overtime, you put 1,000 a year in my pocket. Moments are the elements of profit.